So why do we need to go up there into space? That's the question that my daughter Katya and Olga asked me when they realized I was working, working at a space agency as a data scientist. So, you know, I told them we launched satellite uh, to look at the universe, understand how it works, uh, where it comes from, and also to visit new planets like Mars. But equally important, we can look back at our planet, see the big picture to study it, see the impact of what we do, and also enable weather prediction that you see on the TV every day. But they were not looking very excited with that. So I told them, you know, when we go on holiday as a family, the nice voice from the navigator in the car that you like to hear wouldn't be able to say where to go if there were no GPS satellite up there. And that triggered a bit more their curiosity, but still not the full excitement. <laughs> Until the day they met with the astronaut Paolo Nespoli during an open day event at ESA. And Paolo was just magnificent to inspire them about the value of space, the beauty of our planet. And they also understood that day that when you are in space, you are a citizen of a planet because you don't see any political boundaries. So they came back home extremely excited. And they asked me, can you become an astronaut? It's too cool. And I said, listen, uh, I would love to, but it's a bit late for me. And then they were disappointed, so I, I told them, you know, at work, every day on my computer, I can have the same view as Paolo Nespoli gets from the space station, but I can get a better one because I can see through clouds with a radar. They didn't fully understand that, but they, they were impressed because they thought I had some kind of superpower. <laughs> so they came up with that drawing at school for a contest where in the eyes of digital native they have, a satellite is just a tool to take a permanent selfie of the Earth to keep it safe. <laughs> and apparently it works because it's smiling. But this, is, this beautiful photograph is actually the first selfie of the Earth in its full beauty. It was taken by Apollo astronauts in 1972 when they were heading to the moon. And I was so lucky because I was just born in time to be on that picture, which became the most famous in human history. And the reason is very simple. Uh, this perspective is so powerful, so emotional. In fact, at that time, it gave a wake-up call to the planet that uh, the public realized that we are all traveling on one ship with limited reserves of water and air that we need to manage. And this has shaped the whole thinking on sustainability for decades. But this picture also shows the fragility of the Earth. If you zoom in, you would see that the atmosphere, the one that protects us from radiation, is actually extremely thin. If the Earth were my hand, it would be no bigger than one of my hair. So we need to care about that. We need to manage this as a treasure. And to manage that, we need to measure it. That's why space agencies around the world have been collaborating for decades to build a global fleet of satellites that operate like a microscope in space to check the health of our planet. And Europe has been uh, very important in this partnership because we are deploying now the new generation of mission that in the framework of an initiative called Copernicus that will do global mapping of the Earth day and night for decades at 10 meter resolution. And the satellites that will do that are called the Sentinels, uh, just to refer to their role of guardian of the Earth, but this time not from a high tower, but from 800 kilometers high in orbit to warn us about problems. The first one was launched two years ago only. Since then, we launched three others with their own speciality. And although the family of mission is, not, is far from complete, it has dramatically expanded our vision of our planet. From the monitoring of the remote regions in the polar, uh, regions to the state of the ocean and also the land where you can see the scale of the fields. So the good news is that this data will be there for decades, so you will be able to see very little trend in uh, our environment and constrain model to make predictions so we can navigate our future without being blind. And the other good news about that is that the data is for free and open and we are spreading it as much as we can to all our communities, 
policy makers, but also oceanographers who use it for modeling, the farmer in the field, even the most exotic one like the Inuits who take our maps to look at the ice condition before going fishing with their ski too. But what are these satellites telling us about the state of the planet? Unfortunately, it's not as the Earth is not as smiling as it was on the drawing of my daughter. In fact, it's under high pressure. When that picture was taken, we were 3 billion on the planet. We are now 7 billion, and we are heading to 9 billion when my kids will be my age. This put enormous pressure on resources like water, energy, food, etc. So our footprint as a human becomes bigger and bigger, and you can see it from space. You can see, for example, uh, the impact in the atmosphere, where we have uh, dramatically changed the composition in this thin layer. This is a map of uh, nitrogen oxide, which is released by the burning of fossil fuel, and it leads to pollution and, and smog, which has then an impact on our health. So what it tells you here is that pollution is now a global issue. It's no more local. And you have hotspots all over the world, like in industrialized countries, North Europe, North America, and North China, but also in megacities like Mexico and Hong Kong. And this data takes actually the pulse of the economic activity because it's related to the uh, production of energy and also the transport. So if you look at the time series of it, you can spot weekend. You can understand that on Sunday, uh, the concentration goes down in Europe because people do not work, while in China, it stays the same. So with that kind of data, you can also monitor air quality and implement policy. For example, you would see if we decrease the transport, you would see a decrease in this. We are also dramatically changing our land. 40% of our land has been cleared for producing food. This is a picture of Sentinel-2 taken a few days after launch, showing the beauty and diversity of fields in the regions of Pavia. This shows the importance of agriculture. So we have now data like this all over the world on a frequent basis, and scientists can use this to calculate the total amount of crop in the world, and this is very useful to sustain food security, for example, and to prevent hunger. And all these activities of agriculture, energy production, they lead to climate change, and we see the footprint from space, in particular in the polar region, because there is an effect of amplification. So the warming we see is leading to a melting of the sea ice. This is the Arctic sea ice extent, which acts as a pulse of the climate, um, growing in winter and shrinking in summer. And our long-term data have shown that this is decreasing by 10% per decade. And we have also launched another mission to look at the, the other dimension of it, the thickness, so that we have a 3D view, and the volume is decreasing as well. So scientists predict that during this century, during summer, there won't be any sea ice anymore. And this has a lot of geopolitical implications for transport, shipping, but also exploration of oil and gas. And that leads also to a bigger warming of the Earth, which in turn leads to a melting again of the glaciers, which is one of the key indicators of climate change. And they are retreating all over the world. We've seen this in uh, Africa, in Alaska, but also in South America. I picked up this example in particular because of the name, Inesplorado, which I found uh, very poetic. But it also tells you it's very far away. But still, it feels the impact of climate change, and we can capture from space that this glacier is disappearing at 25% over th 30 years. So what I find fascinating about this data is that they not only tell you where the problem is, but they also give you elements on how to address this problem and to improve your quality of life. So I'm on a mission now to spread it as much as I can so then you can unleash your creativity on it. And we do that with different communities. Uh, we work with entrepreneurs and small companies to turn their ideas into business opportunity. This is an example of an app camp we did uh, during the Mobile Congress in Barcelona. We invite a bunch of guys, entrepreneurs, students. Uh, you ask them some ideas. They come with very interesting ideas, sometimes totally crazy, but that's what we want. And uh, this is just a few examples. The most popular one is the smart farming, which is putting together the data from the satellites with weather data plus the observation of the farmer 
integrate them, create information to manage the field, you know where to put the nutrients, when to harvest, etc. So you optimize your production. And this is key to feed the 9 billion I was talking about before. Air quality apps. It's basically taking the data from the pollution map I've shown you at the global scale, use model to make it relevant at the local scale, so that when you go running, you can have an itinerary where there is good air quality. Another one I picked because my wife loved that one is how to optimize your sun basing when you're on the beach. Uh, this one takes data, very sophisticated actually, data from aerosol clouds plus some picture that you do from your skin type and it calculates the dose you can have and then send you an SMS when you need to put some cream on. <laughs> but this data is also relevant for saving life. So we support also policy with this, we support civil protection. This is a service from Copernicus which uh, did a map of flood in the France uh, for the recent flood that helps the civil protection in its rescue operation. And this map is updated all the time. This one is from one week ago. And we engage as well with uh, citizens, all of us. Uh, not only to use the data or to look at it, but to do real science with it. Uh, they can enrich it with their own observation, look for pattern, classification, etc. This is an example of students remotely monitoring the forest in Indonesia for illegal logging. They basically adopt a little hexagon and they looked at it. And if there is a change, they can alert some of the people on the ground who could go and check and take picture. So this is very powerful because this is a tool to create environmental democracy, to keep people accountable for what they do. And here we use the data and the maps as a tool to build a shared understanding across different stakeholders where everybody can put his own local knowledge. Uh, this is a holy tree, this place I know, etc. So that it builds bridges between people who make decisions. So, to wrap up, I think it's a very exciting time, uh, not only for me, but for everybody who wants to be in the business of this data because we are really at the early stage of a revolution for open and global mapping of our planet. In fact, we are able now to take the pulse of the planet as never before, with sensors in space, on drones, or on your mobile phone. And this data tells you a lot of things, like you see here, you see the changes at the global scale, uh, you see the interaction, the, uh, the ocean is warming, it melts the ice which affect Greenland, which then affect the land. So you feel that we are part of a system, it's interconnected. So all these data is really useful to do excellent science applications, but of course there are challenges like making sense of uh, this big data. And there we will need new technologies like artificial intelligence, but also a lot of capacity building because we need education and we will educate the future planetary doctors and the future leaders. But to come back to the drawing of Katya and Olga, the thing that fascinates me most about this technology is actually not the technology itself, but it's the ability to look at us from outside and to appreciate the global impact of what we do locally. Because as you've seen, you don't need to be an expert to see that the sea ice is melting, the glaciers are melting, or there is an ozone hole. You can grasp the size of the problem. So I believe that this capability can help renew our sense of responsibility about this change and can empower all of us to become a kind of sentinel of the Earth to spot changes from your tower on Earth or from the satellites, but also to make these changes visible and accessible to everybody with digital technologies, so that we can increase transparency and accountability, but also develop the coolest apps to address the problems. So to conclude, I think the challenge is not only to extract the, the right information from this big data, but also to be able to react to it collectively to preserve our planet and keep it safe for us and future generations. Thank you.